The story begins with a man named Tetsuo, who works in an office and has a deep love for mystery novels. Tetsuo's life revolves around his job and his concern for his daughter, Reika, who is attending college and living in her own apartment. One day, Tetsuo is taken by surprise when Reika removes her mask, revealing her face covered in bruises. She explains that the bruises are from a recent fall, but Tetsuo's extensive reading of detective stories makes him skeptical. He finds it hard to believe her explanation and questions Reika about the number of times she has fallen. Tetsuo even wonders if her boyfriend might be responsible for her injuries. However, Tetsuo's probing questions upset Reika, and she decides to leave. This leaves Tetsuo feeling guilty for letting his obsession with detective stories complicate his relationship with his daughter. Tetsuo decides to visit his daughter's apartment despite her initial discouragement. As a concerned father, he just wants to make sure Reika is safe. Meanwhile, a young man named Nobuto leaves the apartment building and talks to his friends. Nobuto, who has blonde hair, casually mentions that he had beaten his girlfriend, referring to her as a promiscuous woman he hit about five or six times. His friends ask for her name, and to their surprise, Nobuto says her name is Reika. Hearing this, Tetsuo becomes convinced that his daughter didn't fall. She was actually physically abused by Nobuto. Tetsuo tries to follow Nobuto, but is stopped by one of Nobuto's associates, who knows that Tetsuo intends to tail him. Tetsuo is then taken to an alley, where he is beaten and forced to undress. They even take pictures of his ID card to make sure he won't take any further action against them. Tetsuo realizes that Nobuto is involved with a dangerous criminal syndicate known as the Yakuza. On that evening, Tetsuo found himself at an internet cafe. He needed to let his wife, Kasen, know about an accident he'd been in, which left him injured and currently in the hospital. Tetsuo wanted to reassure Kasen that it wasn't a major problem and that he might be back home by the next day. He also wanted her to know that their daughter, Reika, was okay, and he asked Kasen not to worry. However, deep inside, Tetsuo was feeling uneasy and fearful. He couldn't bring himself to share the truth of Kasen, knowing that their daughter had been in a risky situation all this time. The following day, Tetsuo called his workplace to request a day off. Afterward, he visited Reika's apartment once more, where he listened to the soothing piano music that his daughter used to play when she was 18 years old. Back then, Reika had mentioned that she might never play that particular song again, and he could offer to sell him a cassette for an extra 300,000 yen as pocket money. Since that moment, this song had become Tetsuo's favorite. Luckily, Tetsuo had a spare key to his daughter's apartment. As he entered, everything seemed normal at first glance. But then he spotted a whiskey glass, two toothbrushes, and a pack of cigarettes on the table. It made Tetsuo more worried about his daughter's safety. Suddenly, he decided to hide when he heard someone trying to enter the apartment. To his shock, the person who walked in was Nobuto. Nobuto was busy talking on the phone with his subordinate, Kubo, at that moment. In their conversation, Nobuto revealed his sinister plans. He admitted to extorting money from Reika and then dumping her. Nobuto has a history of the same crime, which involves extorting money from the girls he dates and harming them. Now, Reika was his target, and he wanted to get his hands on her inheritance, which her mom had informed him about, left by her wealthy grandparents. Meanwhile, Kubo informed Nobuto that their gang had captured someone who was trying to follow him. The person was Tetsuo, Reika's father, and this enraged Nobuto, suspecting that Reika had complained to her dad about the abuse she suffered at his hands, which could ruin his wicked plans. Meanwhile, Tetsuo, who had been hiding in the closet, was starting to figure out his daughter's boyfriend's wicked scheme. Unexpectedly, Tetsuo's phone slipped, making Nobuto suspicious. He wanted to open the closet. Fortunately, Tetsuo managed to call his daughter's phone that was left in the apartment. When Nobuto answered the call, he scolded Tetsuo and asked where he was with intentions to harm him. In that moment, Tetsuo couldn't help but stay silent, thinking about the happiness of his family just a day ago, when it was just the three of them. Tetsuo valued his wife and daughter above all else, and as the head of his family, he was determined to protect them no matter what. Tetsuo began responding to Nobuto's threats, challenging him to try his worst, and this only made Nobuto angrier. However, Tetsuo realized that he couldn't physically overpower Nobuto, so he came up with a plan. He messaged Reika, telling her to prepare a surprise in the closet for Nobuto. 
When Nobuto tried to open the closet, Tetsuo attacked him and in the struggle managed to kill him. Surprisingly, Nobuto wasn't just an ordinary person. He was the son of Tokyo's Yakuza boss, a man named Matori. Meanwhile, Nobuto's two trusted assistants, Kiyoichi and Kubo, had been waiting in the car since he entered Reika's apartment, but he hadn't come back out. Kubo grew suspicious and asked Kiyoichi to go inside with him. Around the same time, Kasen arrived at their daughter's apartment. She was shocked to find Tetsuo and a lifeless body lying beside him. Tetsuo quickly explained what had happened, revealing that the lifeless body was Reika's boyfriend, who had harmful intentions towards her. Kasen wanted to know if Tetsuo's actions could be considered self-defense. Tetsuo thought it might be possible if they could prove it in court. However, he remembered that there was a photo of him with his ID card, and he worried that Nobuto's subordinates wouldn't let this go and might keep harassing them. Tetsuo realized that he had just tangled with a dangerous Yakuza group, and fear consumed him. Seeing her husband in distress, Kasen reassured him and understood that Tetsuo had acted to protect their daughter. Therefore, Kasen decided to stand by him and help tackle this problem together. She asked Tetsuo to clean up the place before Reika arrived. Outside the apartment, Kiyoichi told Kubo that he had overheard a conversation inside, including the voice of a woman who had just entered. Kiyoichi suspected that the woman might be Reika's mother, but he didn't hear Nobuto's voice with them. Shortly after, when Reika returned home and found her parents in her apartment, she was surprised. Tetsuo then explained to Reika about the encounter with her arrogant blonde-haired boyfriend. He told her that Nobuto had even punched him in the face and threatened to harm Reika as well. Tetsuo asked Reika to go home with her mother while he took care of her apartment. At first, Reika was confused about why Nobuto was angry and wanted to harm her. Tetsuo clarified that Nobuto was upset because he thought Reika had invited her dad over, even though she hadn't. Kasen then asked Reika how someone like Nobuto could hurt her and suggested that a man like him should just perish. Kasen's anger and words frightened Reika. Reika turned out to be a girl new to love, deeply infatuated with Nobuto, despite knowing he was cruel. She believed that his handsome blonde-haired appearance meant he could change someday. After Kasen and Reika left the apartment, Kiyoichi quickly entered to find out where Nobuto had gone. Seeing the doorknob had been tampered with, Tetsuo suspected that it might be one of Nobuto's accomplices looking for him. Successfully opening the door, Kiyoichi immediately searched the apartment to figure out where Nobuto had disappeared to. A few days later, Kubo had a meeting with Nobuto's father, Matori. During their conversation, Kubo was impressed by Matori's ability to change his personality and voice to manipulate situations. Matori even went as far as threatening the police to protect his business. In the course of their talk, Matori inquired if Kubo would be willing to eliminate someone outside of their business. Kubo responded that he had no problem with taking someone's life. Matori briefly mentioned people who had provoked his anger in the past. First, it was his former boss who had mistreated him at work. Then, it was Nobuto's school teachers who had failed to educate his son properly. Lastly, it was the police who had once arrested Nobuto when he was in middle school, along with Matori's wife, who had left him and Nobuto. As Matori reminisced about these events, he realized that despite being a father, he felt powerless and couldn't protect anyone. His desire for revenge against those who wronged him still lingered, but Matori admitted to himself that he was too weak to harm anyone. However, now that someone had dared to harm his son Nobuto, who had vanished without a trace, Matori's determination to seek justice was stronger than ever. Nobuto was his only son and Matori wouldn't forgive anyone who harmed him. Therefore, Matori asked Kubo to handle anyone responsible for Nobuto's disappearance. Meanwhile, Kiyoichi returned to Reika's apartment and realized there was still someone inside. To his surprise, that person turned out to be Tetsuo, who had cleverly disguised himself as a house cleaner, going by the name Suzuki. Kiyoichi pretended to be a friend of Reika, claiming to have a spare key to her apartment, and said he was there to find his friend's lost phone. He requested permission to call the phone, secretly hoping that Nobuto would answer, but the attempt was unsuccessful. 
Kubo was getting confused about Nobuto's whereabouts and instructed Kiyoichi to continue keeping an eye on Reika. If Nobuto didn't return soon, they were considering the possibility of kidnapping Reika for questioning. As for Tetsuo, he had managed to completely destroy Nobuto's phone, making it impossible to contact him. Tetsuo started to encourage himself, telling himself not to be afraid since he had just started this trouble. Shortly after, Ka-sen returned to the apartment with the items that Tetsuo had requested in the message. However, finding a copper plate proved to be challenging. Nevertheless, Tetsuo thanked Ka-sen and explained his plan. He intended to use the bathtub as a makeshift pot to cook Nobuto. Tetsuo's plan involved boiling Nobuto's body repeatedly to make it shrink, similar to cooking meat. Although it sounded gruesome, Ka-sen tried to support Tetsuo and asked how she could help. However, Tetsuo requested that Ka-sen go home and prepare a delicious meal for their daughter. Following his plan, Tetsuo wasted no time in attempting to cook Nobuto. However, he realized that Reika's apartment had a plastic bathtub that could warp if exposed to hot water for too long. To tackle this issue, Tetsuo started crafting a basic heat insulator. He lined the bathtub with layers of cardboard, using tinfoil to replace the missing copper plate. He secured everything with aluminum tape to make sure the cardboard insulator stayed dry. Tetsuo hoped this setup would work without damaging the bathtub or leaving any unpleasant odors. After cooking Nobuto repeatedly for an extended period, his body finally managed to fit inside a medium-sized suitcase. At first glance, it would be hard to believe that a full-grown adult could fit in there. When they returned home, Tetsuo told Reika that her apartment was quite messy and he might need to clean it often. He suggested that she consider attending college from home. After showing Tetsuo a card magic trick, Reika continued to watch a horror movie she hadn't seen before. In that moment, Tetsuo watched his daughter from behind and realized how much she had grown. Tetsuo felt grateful that everything had remained safe and healthy so far. He prayed to God that the three of them would continue to live peacefully without anyone missing. However, Tetsuo's dramatic thoughts left Reika confused. The following day, Ka sent informed Tetsuo about a suspicious foreign car parked near their house. Tetsuo was certain that Nobuto's henchmen were watching them, and he noticed the car had been there since the previous night. Nevertheless, he tried to act normal, loading his suitcase into the car's trunk. He asked Ka sen to send a message if the car followed him. As Tetsuo drove away, he realized that the car wasn't tailing him. They were interested in something else. Tetsuo made a stop at a store to purchase some necessary items, but worried about leaving his car unattended, especially with the suitcase containing the body inside. Unexpectedly, another Yakuza member began following Tetsuo's car. Fortunately, Tetsuo had anticipated this. The Yakuza members reported to Kiyoichi and assumed that the suitcase contained clothes, thinking Tetsuo was on a business trip. However, Kiyoichi instructed his men not to lower their guard and to keep an eye on Tetsuo. Tetsuo became extremely anxious when he discovered that someone had opened his suitcase. He could tell because he had placed a piece of cloth inside as a marker. However, the suitcase was now sealed tightly and neatly arranged, suggesting that someone was indeed watching him. If they hadn't acted recklessly, it meant they didn't know that Nobuto had been killed by him. However, Tetsuo also realized that they would likely continue investigating his family. Upon returning home, Tetsuo carefully unpacked everything from the suitcase, worried that listing devices might have been planted. Realizing it was too risky to handle things outside, he decided to dispose of Nobuto's body within the room. By chance, Tetsuo visited a gardening store and bought a compost accelerator with various microbes. He sprinkled this on the organic material and covered it with moist soil to start the decomposition process. Tetsuo estimated that with 10 grams of compost accelerator and 1 kilogram of organic material, the body would decompose significantly within a day, given it was human flesh. Hearing this, Ka-sen was surprised by Tetsuo's knowledge. Unexpectedly, Reika suddenly appeared, thinking her parents wanted to grow vegetables. She initially wanted to help but decided to have breakfast first. Meanwhile, Kiyoichi and his associate continued to monitor Reika's house. They realized that Reika and her parents were in the front yard. To find out what they were up to, Kiyoichi instructed another companion named Singo to investigate. Kiyoichi planned to sneak into the house to search for clues regarding Nobuto's disappearance. 
Shortly after, Singo approached them, posing as a housing appraiser conducting a survey for a 10,000 yen prize draw. While Singo engaged them in conversation, Kiyoichi attempted to investigate inside Reika's house, hoping to find clues. When Singo eventually left, Tetsuo and Kasen had already grown suspicious of him being one of the spies watching them. Tetsuo remembered that their house was empty, but everything seemed undisturbed, including the potted plants. Unexpectedly, Kiyoichi was hiding behind a closet, wondering why Tetsuo and Ka Sen had rushed into that room and started discussing potted plants, finding their behavior suspicious. The following day, Ka Sen was cleaning the house and noticed that the table had been moved. She also found an unfamiliar power outlet. After dismantling it, they discovered it was a listening device, likely planted by the spies when they were all in the yard the day before. Tetsuo was convinced that there were probably many more listening devices in the house. That night, Kiyoichi didn't give up and continued to watch them. He began to overhear Tetsuo and Kasen's conversation. Unexpectedly, Tetsuo and Kasen engaged in a rehearsed conversation that made it seem as if Tetsuo knew nothing about Nobuto's disappearance. Tetsuo even pretended to inquire about Reika's difficulties in contacting her boyfriend since yesterday. In their made-up conversation, Kasen also claimed not to know anything. But according to Reika's story, her boyfriend had gone silent when she asked Nobuto to pick her up at the campus. Kasen expressed concern that something might have happened to Nobuto, as she had noticed a stalker or a strange man following Reika. So that there was a possibility that Nobuto was dealing with Reika's stalker, and that's why there was no news of him. In reality, there was no stalker following Reika, and this was all a fabricated story by Tetsuo to deceive Kiyoichi into believing that they had no knowledge of Nobuto's disappearance. They also pretended to find several listening devices in the house, suspecting that the people following Reika had planted them. Tetsuo and Ka Sen even expressed suspicion about the foreign car parked near their house and planned to call the police. Kiyoichi realized that he was under suspicion and decided it was best to leave to protect himself. Meanwhile, Ka Sen didn't expect Tetsuo to come up with all these scenarios. Tetsuo reminded Ka Sen that he was a fan of mystery and detective novels, which is why he could come up with solutions in situations like this. If he had never the read books, he would have been hopeless from the beginning. Hearing this, Ka Sen assured Tetsuo that she would always support him because she didn't want to lose anyone in the house, just like Tetsuo, who also didn't want to lose anyone. Tetsuo was moved and felt guilty for involving his beloved wife in danger. However, he was also grateful to have a wife who understood the difficult situations they faced and knew that the path they had chosen led to destruction. Although they had successfully hidden the murder, they would carry the guilt for the rest of their lives. That night, Tetsuo returned from work and went back to his daughter's apartment to erase any traces of his crime. Meanwhile outside, Kiyoichi had been following Tetsuo and reported to Kubo that he couldn't approach the apartment due to police patrolling the area. However, it had been nearly one and a half hours and Tetsuo still hadn't come out, raising Kiyoichi's suspicions about what Tetsuo might be doing inside. Furthermore, Kiyoichi was convinced that the story Tetsuo and Ka Sen told about spies monitoring them through listening devices was a lie. Kiyoichi was confident because earlier in the day, he had investigated Reika's campus and had his friends ask Reika directly about the alleged stalker. Unexpectedly, Reika admitted that she didn't feel followed or spied upon by anyone. On the other hand, Reika had also told her mom the same story, that her friends suddenly asked about the person stalking her, even though she didn't feel that way. Ka Sen was shocked because the story of Reika's stalker was a made-up tale by her husband to mislead the people spying on their house. She never expected someone would go as far as investigating it at Reika's campus. Following Kubo's orders, some Yakuza members entered Reika's house to question Ka Sen. Meanwhile, Kiyoichi and his colleague planned to capture Tetsuo. Not long after, Tetsuo was captured by Kiyoichi, his head covered and bound. Kiyoichi refused to reveal their identities to Tetsuo and only reminded him that he and Ka Sen had discussed the stalker in front of a listening device the night before. Therefore, Kiyoichi demanded that Tetsuo admit it was all a lie since he had investigated it directly with Reika's friends on campus. Kiyoichi continued to beat Tetsuo as he forced him to answer. Tetsuo couldn't endure the torture and decided to tell the truth about the stalker Kiyoichi was referring to. 
However, he started fabricating another story, explaining that it was Ka Send and not Rei Ka who first noticed the stalker. So Rei Ka genuinely didn't know if someone was following her. Tetsuo explained that it all began in November last year when his wife told him about the stalker. At that time, Tetsuo wanted to inform his daughter to be cautious, but his wife had forbidden him from doing so to avoid disrupting Reika's school exams. Therefore, they decided not to tell Reika and hired an all-around detective named Suzu Ki to investigate the stalker. Hearing this, Kiyoichi remembered the man he had encountered at Reika's apartment. Shortly afterward, Kiyoichi received a call from Matori, Nobuto's father. Matori had heard from Kubo that Kiyoichi had taken on the task of searching for his missing son. Matori shared that he couldn't focus on his work since his son's disappearance, as Nobuto was his only hope and his sole heir. If Nobuto wasn't found soon, Matori might lose the will to live. Kiyoichi panicked, realizing that Matori was losing hope and the failure to find Nobuto could lead to their organization disbanding. He reassured his boss that he would do everything in his power to locate his son. On the other hand, Reikao was missing her boyfriend, Nobuto, whom she hadn't seen in a while. Meanwhile, Tetsuo was taken to a higher location and sensed the floor beginning to move. He'd assumed he was on top of a building and understood that one wrong move could be fatal. Tetsuo was bombarded with questions by Kiyoichi, who informed him that they were searching for a man named Nobuto, missing since he entered Reika's apartment on Friday. Tetsuo didn't respond directly, so he was pushed and fell, but he remained in the room, tied with a rope around his leg. He was beaten again and questioned about Nobuto's disappearance at Reika's apartment. Tetsuo continued to claim he knew nothing. However, Detective Suzuki was at Reika's apartment at that time, and he informed them that Nobuto had suddenly become agitated and left the apartment. Tetsuo deliberately fabricated another story to avoid suspicion, saying that Suzuki valued his privacy and only provided an email address for contact, requesting that their message history be frequently deleted. Kiyoichi proceeded to injure Tetsuo's face and planned to question Kasen next. Kiyoichi explained that if Kasen's answers didn't align with Tetsuo's, they might harm Reika. Tetsuo pleaded with them not to hurt his family, especially his daughter, if their stories matched. Using Tetsuo's phone, Kiyoichi directly questioned Ka-sen about the stalker of Reika. Surprisingly, Ka-sen's account matched Tetsuo's. She began narrating that it all started in November of the previous year, when she first noticed someone stalking Reika. However, knowing that Reika was preparing for university entrance exams, Ka-sen decided not to inform her directly. Instead, she discussed it privately with her husband and they eventually hired a private detective named Suzu Ki to investigate the stalker. The reason their stories matched was because Tetsuo had asked Ka-sen to memorize the fabricated story he had created the day before. He had foreseen the possibility of being interrogated by the organization. Kiyoichi then inquired about what Ka-sen knew about Nobuto before he disappeared. Ka-sen was confused since her husband hadn't taught her this question. However, realizing the urgency, Ka Send acted panicked and pretended not to know anything, diverting the conversation to another topic, which frustrated the Yakuza members. They reported to Kiyoichi that they decided to leave because Ka Send appeared to know nothing, and they didn't want to risk getting caught by the police. Shortly after, Kubo contacted Kiyoichi, expressing his frustration that their mission to find Nobuto hadn't been successful. Kubo decided to assign the task to another one of his men, Takeda. Kiyoichi felt frustrated with his unsuccessful efforts. He then began to remove the covering from Tetsuo's head, and Tetsuo realized that Kiyoichi was the man who had posed as Reika's friend the previous day. Kiyoichi assured Tetsuo that Ka-sen was safe, but he still intended to kill Tetsuo, believing that he had killed Nobuto and disposed of his body in the sea to save himself from punishment. When Kiyoichi pulled out a knife, Tetsuo had no choice but to propose that they work together to find Nobuto with the limited information he had. It seemed risky, but it was Tetsuo's only chance to survive. After spending three days in the clinic, Tetsuo reunited with his wife. He told Ka Sen that their plan had worked, and they were likely no longer under suspicion from the Yakuza. In reality, Tetsuo had lied because he had became even more deeply involved in the search for Nobuto with Kiyoichi. He lied to protect his wife from further involvement in this dangerous situation, 
choosing to face it alone. That evening, Kiyotichi picked up Tetsuo to exchange information and questioned why Tetsuo had followed Nobuto. Tetsuo explained that he had seen his daughter with bruises on her face that day and had gone to Reika's apartment out of concern. He had overheard someone mentioning Reika's name and instinctively followed Nobuto. Their first investigation led them to a club that Nobuto had visited the day before he disappeared. There, they met a hostess named Hibiki, who was also Nobuto's girlfriend. Tetsuo was angered and surprised to learn that Nobuto had another woman while he was already with Reika. Hibiki, like Reika, was deeply in love with Nobuto despite knowing he was unfaithful. She even criticized Reika as inexperienced and unattractive. Tetsuo was furious with Nobuto and had no regrets about killing him. Later, Tetsuo received a message from Kiyoichi asking him to return. When he went back, only Hibiki was there, as Kiyoichi monitored their conversation through a listening device. Hibiki realized that Tetsuo was Reika's father and asked why he had chosen to get involved in the Yakuza search for Nobuto. Tetsuo admitted that he did it out of necessity to protect his daughter. As long as Reika remained a suspect in Nobuto's disappearance, she would be in danger. Tetsuo developed a plan to trick Hibiki. He told her that there might be Yakuza members who had betrayed Nobuto and hidden the truth. They could be pretending to search for him just to deceive their superiors. Tetsuo suggested that Nobuto, known for causing trouble, might still be alive and in hiding. He asked Hibiki to share any information she had about Nobuto to aid their search, promising not to disclose it to anyone else. Hibiki admitted that Nobuto was indeed troublesome, but she hoped he would be found soon. She shared a secret he had confessed to her about a year and a half ago. Nobuto had revealed that if the Yakuza ever planned to rob an armored money transport vehicle, he had already crashed a foreign car into one and taken the money before them. Shockingly, the foreign car was Nobuto's, and he had betrayed his own accomplices. Tetsuo was stunned by this revelation, realizing that Nobuto had betrayed his own partners. Luckily, Kiyoichi's listening device malfunctioned, so he didn't hear their conversation. Ibiki also mentioned Nobuto's social media account, suggesting that his subordinates or organization members might be following it. Tetsuo tried to recall the account name. However, other Yakuza members approached Tetsuo and Kiyoichi, handing them a 10 million yen check they were required to pay. It turned out to be a trap to extract money from them. Tetsuo realized that there was competition and rivalry among the Yakuza members. Tetsuo and Kiyoichi found themselves in a tight spot as they didn't have enough money to pay the bar leader. To settle their debt, they were assigned a task by the bar leader and his members. They were taken to a remote road near the forest, where they met Denji, one of the bar leader's subordinates. Genji informed them about an upcoming transaction between two Yakuza groups, the Rokin Gumi and the Okai Ten. Their job was to steal the bag of money from the Okai Ten group. Kiyoichi was initially annoyed by the task, but when Genji signaled them, they acted swiftly and managed to steal the money. However, their car was shot at and caught fire. Kiyoichi was wounded in the process, and Tetsuo rushed him into the woods for safety. Another group of Yakuza, led by Kubo, arrived and confronted the two opposing groups. While they hid in the woods, a member of the Rokin Gumi who had escaped appeared, threatening to shoot them. Fortunately, Kubo intervened and killed the man. Kubo then quickly removed the bullet from Kiyoichi's body. Kubo was furious with Kiyoichi for not following his orders and for getting close to Tetsuo. Additionally, Tetsuo became a witness to the night's events. To ensure Tetsuo's silence, Kubo created a fake video in which Tetsuo had to confess to killing a member of the Rokin Gumi. This video served as a threat to prevent Tetsuo from revealing what happened that night, and it could also be used to extort money from Kasen's wealthy parents. As morning arrived, Tetsuo returned home, visibly exhausted. Kasen, concerned for her husband's well-being, asked him not to keep any secrets from her. Tetsuo, wanting to shield his family from further involvement, hesitated but ultimately confessed to his ongoing dealings with the Yakuza. Kasen, feeling that they were in this together as a family, insisted on helping. Tetsuo apologized and explained that he had three days to locate Nobuto, or the Yakuza would consider him responsible for Nobuto's disappearance. Kasen then wanted to know Tetsuo's plan. 
Tetsuo's plan was to create fake evidence, suggesting that Nobuto was still alive, and he knew just the person to play the role of Nobuto in a video. Ka-sen then recounted their college days 21 years ago, when they were part of a campus drama club, and their friend Tabata was desperate to become an actor but faced continuous rejections. In the present, while Ka-sen was busy cleaning Reika's apartment bathroom to erase any signs of the murder, she met with Tabata and shared their plan to create a short video. They asked Tabata to play the role, and all he needed to do was walk while wearing a wig, with his face not shown in the video, recorded from the car's dashboard. Kasen mentioned that Tetsuo couldn't join them because he was occupied with work. During their conversation, Tabata asked Kasen about her happiness in her marriage with Tetsuo. Kasen reminisced about the early days of their relationship, which her parents strongly opposed. They had even physically harmed Tetsuo. However, Tetsuo's fearless determination in facing these challenges had touched Kasen's heart, and she believed she could find happiness with him. Kasen described their life together as wonderful with Tetsuo always doing his best to protect her. Meanwhile, Tetsuo attempted to hack into Nobuto's social media account, as suggested by Hibiki. However, he struggled to crack the account's password. Thankfully, Hibiki offered to help by providing Nobuto's phone, which he had left at her house. Tetsuo immediately checked Nobuto's email account, but there was still one more security password to enter, which the name of Nobuto's pet. Unfortunately, neither Hibiki nor Reika knew the name of Nobuto's pet. The following night, Tetsuo went to a bar in the Shinjuku area, which was a place Nobuto frequented, according to information from Hibiki. Tetsuo hoped to gather information or materials to deceive the Yakuza members. Upon his arrival, Tetsuo coincidentally sat next to Matori. However, neither Tetsuo nor Matori recognized each other. In their conversation, Matori shared his experience of losing a child and asked Tetsuo what he would do if his beloved child were in danger. To Tetsuo's surprise, Matori expressed his willingness to protect his child at any cost, even if it meant harming those responsible and their families. Matori's words left Tetsuo feeling fearful and disturbed. Afterward, Matori introduced himself and left. Tetsuo then inquired with the bartender about a man named Nobuto. The bartender confirmed that Nobuto was a regular customer and revealed that the man who had been sitting next to Tetsuo was, in fact, Nobuto's father. Tetsuo was deeply shocked and burdened with guilt about his actions. He realized that Nobuto had his own life, a loving girlfriend, and a father who would always care for him. Shortly after, Tetsuo returned home, and Kasen reported the successful creation of a short video with Tabata's help. Tetsuo then shared how he had encountered Nobuto's father at the bar and briefly conversed with him. However, their primary focus now was discovering the security password for Nobuto's email account, which was linked to his pet's name. Tetsuo recalled Matori, mentioning the name Cap from Nobuto's childhood, which they suspected might be the pet's name. Unfortunately, Cap alone didn't work as the password. Kasen thought that Cap might be a nickname and that there could be a full name associated with it. They tried various names, starting with Cap, until finally, the security password unlocked when Tetsuo entered Captain. The following day, Kubo received information from Hibiki regarding a foreign social media account featuring a young man resembling Nobuto. Surprisingly, Nobuto's personal account had commented on the video, confirming his identity and even threatening harm to the person who uploaded it. Kiyoichi, upon hearing this news from Kubo, was profoundly astonished as was Matori, who began to believe that his son might still be alive. However, Kubo needed to verify the authenticity of the video and asked Kiyoichi to promptly meet with Takeda. Kiyoichi arranged for Tetsuo to meet with Takeda and his team, who had consulted experts to analyze the video. According to the experts, the video had been recorded the previous evening around 5 o'clock, and they were currently working on identifying the uploader. Based on Kubo's information, Hibiki had been the first to come across the video. Therefore, Kiyoichi wanted to inquire about Tetsuo's conversation with Hibiki at the bar. Tetsuo confirmed the conversation but mentioned that he hadn't discussed Nobuto much, as his focus had been on Reika. At the same time, they planned to interrogate Hibiki directly. Meanwhile, Hibiki received an email from Nobuto after his long disappearance. Unbeknownst to her, Tetsuo had hacked Nobuto's email. 
she remained unaware of Nobuto's demise, and her assistance to Tetsuo stemmed from her hope that he could locate her lover more swiftly. In the fabricated message, Nobuto informed Hibiki that he was facing trouble with his organization and was currently on the run. He couldn't meet her for the time being and urged her to be patient in order to ensure his safety. This revelation brought tears of joy to Hibiki, as she believed that Nobuto was genuinely still alive. On the other hand, Tetsuo was feeling really bad about how he used Hibiki, but he felt like he had no other option. While Tetsuo and Takeda were checking out the video, Kasen, who was at home, overheard their conversation because Tetsuo had a secret listening device in his hat. If their plan with the fake video failed, Kasen would follow Tetsuo's instructions and go to Plan B, which involved framing Kiyoichi. Shortly afterward, Takeda got news from the identification team that the video was fake, because the person's walk didn't match Nobuto's. However, Takeda was confused about who made the video and why. Detecting something suspicious, Kiyoichi quickly invited Tetsuo to his house and asked him to get his family out of there as soon as possible. When Kiyoichi arrived at Tetsuo's empty house, he started searching for clues inside. He firmly believed that Tetsuo was the real mastermind and had been suspicious since the first time he sneaked into Tetsuo's room with a pot of soil. Kiyoichi wondered why Tetsuo hadn't planted something in it. He also noticed Tetsuo's strange behavior and asked him to take the pot out to the yard to get rid of the soil. Fortunately, thanks to the soil and the microbial accelerator, Nobuto's body had vanished. However, Tetsuo realized that a few strands of Nobuto's hair hadn't decomposed yet, and he hoped that Kiyoichi wouldn't notice. In the tense situation, Tetsuo briefly thought about using a kitchen knife to harm Kiyoichi while he was distracted. At first, he hesitated but gathered the courage because he believed it was for the sake of his family. Fortunately, Kasen returned just in time, preventing Tetsuo from acting recklessly and keeping Kiyoichi from noticing the strands of Nobuto's hair. Once Kiyoichi was handed a cup of coffee with milk, he wasted no time in confessing to Kasen that he belonged to the Yakuza and had placed a listening device in her home. He also mentioned that a group from his organization was coming to interrogate her later that night. Even though Kasen was already aware of Kiyoichi's identity, she responded with anger, making threats. However, Kiyoichi wasn't intimidated by her words because he had a video confession from Tetsuo admitting to a murder. During their heated argument, Kiyoichi suddenly felt a sharp stomach ache. It turned out that the milk used in the coffee had gone bad. Rushing to the bathroom, Kiyoichi had no idea that Kasen had added a laxative to both cups of coffee to divert suspicion, despite her somewhat careless recent actions. Tetsuo, on the other hand, was pleased to have married such a clever woman as Kasen. He took advantage of the situation to access Kiyoichi's laptop and find his address, despite experiencing intense stomach pain himself. In the end, Tetsuo endured the pain and installed a keylogger system on Kiyoichi's laptop. Keylogger is a software that records every keystroke on the keyboard, and Tetsuo's current objective was to hack into Kiyoichi's email account and uncover his address. Tetsuo needed to go behind the house for a bathroom break, which surprised Reika. When Reika entered the house, she ran into Kiyoichi, who claimed to be a co-worker of her dad's. However, Kiyoichi mentioned that he knew about Reika's boyfriend, Nobuto, who had recently gone missing. Shortly after, Kiyoichi left abruptly, leaving Reika, wondering how he had information about Nobuto. After Kiyoichi and Tetsuo left, Kasen quickly accessed the key logger, connected to her phone to get into Kiyoichi's email account and search for his address. Meanwhile, Reika, who was getting ready to leave the house, discovered a letter in her shoe that Kiyoichi had secretly placed there. The letter asked Reika to contact him via email if her parents were hiding something. At the same time, Kasen was taken aback when she read an email conversation between Kiyoichi and his associates in the organization. They were plotting to frame Tetsuo as Nobuto's murderer if Tetsuo didn't receive any clues about Nobuto's disappearance by the deadline they had set. All of this was happening because their boss, Matori, wanted to seek revenge for his son and keep their organization intact. The organization couldn't operate without Matori. Ka Sen became concerned when she read this and sent a quick email to Tetsuo, explaining that they needed to provide clues to Kiyoichi about Nobuto's murderer. 
If they didn't find any leads about the real killer by the next night, Kiyotichi and others would frame Tetsuo as the one who got rid of Nobuto's body in the sea. In the meantime, Kiyoichi brought Tetsuo back to Reika's apartment. Tetsuo worried that they might have missed some evidence of the murder. On the other hand, Kasen managed to visit the address she had found for Kiyoichi, only to discover it was his parents' home, where she met Kiyoichi's mother. Back at Reika's apartment, Kiyoichi searched for any clues regarding Nobuto's disappearance. However, he needed an additional item to help with his investigation and asked his associate to purchase it. At that moment, Tetsuo was curious about the item Kiyoichi had ordered. He remembered the moment when he had to dispose of Nobuto's body and hoped that his week-long effort to cover it up wouldn't come to light. Meanwhile, Kasen, who had coincidentally met Kiyoichi's mother, pretended to be part of a survey team for a shopping contest. Kiyoichi's mother welcomed her visit, and Kasen tried to gather information about Kiyoichi. Kasen found herself in a difficult situation after learning about Kiyoichi's family, especially that his father had been killed by the Yakuza. However, Kiyoichi continued to care for his mother without revealing his Yakuza affiliation. In the bag Kasen brought with her, there was a tablet prepared by Tetsuo. Inside the tablet were edited video clips of the fake Nobuto, along with editing software. Tetsuo had also created a fake social media account for Nobuto within the tablet to strengthen the evidence against Kiyoichi for the fake video. Additionally, there was a cardboard box containing the remaining bone fragments of Nobuto. Tetsuo was confident that this evidence could incriminate Kiyoichi as Nobuto's murderer. Earlier, Tetsuo had asked Ka-sen to place these items in Kiyoichi's house or one of the Yakuza members' houses if the fake video plan failed. Despite feeling torn, Ka-sen had no other option but to make sacrifices to protect Tetsuo. She said her goodbyes and apologized to Kiyoichi's mother, knowing that there was a chance her son might never return home. Ka-sen decided against leaving the trap bag in Kiyoichi's mother's house and instead needed to find Kiyoichi's current address. However, soon after Ka-sen noticed that Kiyoichi was checking his email and had received a message from Reika. Kiyoichi reached out to Reika, offering help with her recent problems and even asking about the detective Suzuki, although Reika didn't recognize detective Suzuki. When Kiyoichi sent a message inviting Reika to meet, Ka-sen promptly messaged Reika, informing her that she knew about her communication with Kiyoichi. Startled, Reika lied and denied exchanging messages with him, but this raised suspicions that those around her were hiding something. Meanwhile, Kiyoichi planned to meet Reika, intending to handcuff Tetsuo and warn him not to escape. As Kiyoichi was getting ready to leave, Tetsuo received a message from Kasen, suggesting that if Kiyoichi wanted to meet Reika, they should exchange messages, possibly meeting at the restaurant near the station. As the situation grew more complicated, Tetsuo urged Kasen to go to Reika's apartment immediately, carrying evidence with her. He also asked her to buy a GPS device for him. Afterward, Tetsuo tried to remove the handcuffs using soap. Just as his wife arrived with the GPS he had ordered, Tetsuo swiftly placed it into an envelope. Before following Reika, Tetsuo became curious about the item Kiyoichi had requested from his accomplice earlier. Using Kiyoichi's hacked email, Tetsuo messaged Kiyoichi's associate, asking him to leave the ordered item in Reika's mailbox and also deliver another envelope from the locker to his apartment. Inside Tetsuo's envelope was a GPS device he planned to use to track Kiyoichi's original address. Once Kiyoichi's associate had left with the envelope containing the GPS, Tetsuo quickly checked what Kiyoichi had ordered and discovered it was an ALS flashlight. Tetsuo and Kasen decided to prevent Reika and Kiyoichi from meeting, but Kasen volunteered to handle it since it would be risky for Tetsuo to be seen by Kiyoichi, making the situation even more complicated. Tetsuo returned to Reika's apartment, carrying the bag of evidence. Following the GPS trail provided by Kiyoichi's associate, he tried to locate Kiyoichi's residence, racing against time to get there before Kiyoichi returned to Reika's apartment. After successfully finding Kiyoichi's apartment, Tetsuo almost ran into Kiyoichi, who had come back to change clothes before meeting Reika. On the other hand, Kasen met Reika and explained she had just been shopping. Kasen suggested they go home together, 
which was a bit inconvenient for Reika, who really wanted to meet Kiyoichi. Tetsuo had already located Kiyoichi's room, but he faced challenges trying to break in. So he changed his plan and decided to enter from the upper floor. Unfortunately, he became desperate when the access door to the rooftop was locked and his time was running out. Despite the difficulty, Tetsuo drew strength from his determination to protect his family and made a small adjustment to his plan. He decided to return to Reika's apartment before Kiyoichi arrived. Luckily, he got back just in time, leaving Kiyoichi frustrated because his meeting with Reika had failed. Kiyoichi then decided to use the ALS flashlight he had ordered, suspecting that Nobuto might have been killed in that room. He turned off the lights and used special glasses to search for clues with the ALS flashlight, which usually helps find blood and fingerprints in the dark. Kiyoichi hoped it would reveal evidence about Nobuto's whereabouts, but unfortunately, he found nothing. Feeling uneasy, Kiyoichi called his associate to inquire about the ALS flashlight. The associate insisted it was an expensive original ALS flashlight and mentioned delivering the requested envelope to Kiyoichi's apartment based on email instructions. This puzzled Kiyoichi because he had never sent those emails, and there was no message history on his laptop. He suspected someone had tampered with it. Kiyoichi reset his laptop, but couldn't accuse Tetsuo, because Tetsuo had been handcuffed and his GPS hadn't moved during his absence. In this situation, Tetsuo seized the opportunity to question Kiyoichi's relationship with Takeda, which appeared strained. Tetsuo suggested that it might have been Takeda who sent the message to frame him as Nobuto's killer, trying to create an alibi and deflect suspicion from himself. Kiyoichi then asked about the contents of the envelope Takeda had sent to his apartment if Tetsuo's suspicion about Takeda was correct. Tetsuo explained to Kiyoichi that the envelope might contain evidence that could implicate him as Nobuto's murderer, urging him to check his apartment to find out what Takeda had sent. A few hours after returning from Kiyoichi's apartment, Tetsuo went to buy a regular flashlight that looked similar to the ALS flashlight, intending to replace it. Therefore, Kiyoichi couldn't find any bloodstain clues or evidence related to Nobuto in Reika's room. Luckily, Kiyoichi was too focused on his mission to notice the difference with the flashlight. So before Kiyoichi realized it was a fake flashlight, Tetsuo began creating an alibi about Takeda, trying to frame him, and asked Kiyoichi to check his apartment now. Upon arriving at his apartment, Kiyoichi felt confident that everything appeared unchanged. Tetsuo pretended to inspect his room and asked about Kiyoichi's extensive cooking equipment. Kiyoichi revealed his plans to open a restaurant soon. While entering his room, Tetsuo became curious about the closet. Kiyoichi explained it contained a safe with money in case his organization was disbanded by the police and his bank account might be frozen. Therefore, Kiyoichi kept his money in a personal safe. Now, Kiyoichi asked Tetsuo to turn around as he wanted to check the safe. However, Tetsuo saw an opportunity to strengthen his accusation against Kiyoichi if he could use the safe. After checking, Kiyoichi felt the safe was still secure. But Tetsuo continued to urge Kiyoichi to search for evidence regarding Takeda's accusations, which made Kiyoichi more suspicious, as if he knew Tetsuo was trying to trap him. However, Tetsuo explained that his concern was about survival and not framing Kiyoichi but trapping Takeda. According to Tetsuo, if Takeda truly aimed to frame Kiyoichi, they could turn the tables using this opportunity. Hearing Tetsuo's assumptions and plan, Kiyoichi chuckled because facing a Yakuza member was no easy task. Kiyoichi then opened up to Tetsuo, sharing that when he was a child, his father had been killed by the Yakuza. However, they cleverly manipulated the situation to make it look like his father had do the unthinkable, leading the police to believe it. This experience taught Kiyoichi that the weak could never achieve justice. So he joined the organization to become stronger and pursue what he believed was just. Over the years, Tetsuo witnessed Kiyoichi's efforts and their shared experiences created a close bond. But with tomorrow being the day of reckoning for the Yakuza organization, one of them might not survive. If Tetsuo's trap succeeded, Kiyoichi would die. Or if Tetsuo failed and was proven guilty of killing Nobuto, he would be the one to die. Unexpectedly, Tetsuo's stomach growled loudly due to hunger since he hadn't eaten all day. 
He asked if there was anything to eat before facing their potential demise. Tetsuo also shared that his parents had died in a multiple car collision on the highway during his high school days. His father was an honest and kind-hearted police officer who loved mystery novels. This made Tetsuo empathize with the loss of parents that Kiyoichi had experienced. On the other hand, Kiyoichi had already looked into Tetsuo's past and knew that the story about his parents was true. In the end, Tetsuo decided to cook for both of them. Not long after, Tetsuo and Kiyoichi met Takeda, who inquired about any progress in finding clues regarding Nobuto's disappearance. Kiyoichi admitted that he hadn't found any clues yet. Takeda added that the video had been confirmed as fake, and the person behind it had used software to upload it anonymously, making it difficult to trace them. It seemed clear that the murderer had created the fake video to delay the discovery of Nobuto's body. Tetsuo, unable to tolerate the cigarette smoke, excused himself to go to the bathroom. Meanwhile, Kasen began implementing Plan B as instructed by Tetsuo. During their conversation, Takeda received a surprising email message. He asked Tetsuo to share any information he had about Kiyodichi, as this new email, if true, could change everything regarding the search for Nobuto. Surprisingly, the message came from another organization, claiming to have stolen the armored car from the case one and a half years ago. About a year and a half ago, Takeda's group had planned to steal an armored car. However, another group had beaten them to it, making off with the armored car before they could act. Now that rival group had sent a message to taunt Takeda's Yakuza organization, mocking them for their incompetence in the failed heist. But seeking revenge was proving difficult because the rival members had scattered and couldn't be found. Nevertheless, there were two individuals who had taken part in the heist alongside Takeda's group and had later joined the Yakuza, which is Nobuto and Kiyoichi. They were known for their strained relationship and never being on good terms. With Nobuto missing and the Yakuza searching for him, Takeda should have had clues about Nobuto's killer, thanks to the failed armored car heist from a year and a half ago. After Tetsuo shared what he knew, Takeda ordered his associates to rush to Nobuto's current residence and search for evidence. They discovered a bag in a hidden room containing a substantial amount of money. Hearing this, Takeda ordered Kiyoichi's arrest, suspecting him of involvement due to the large sum of money found in Nobuto's room. Kiyoichi was baffled by the money's origins but vehemently denied any wrongdoing. When they opened the bag, they found a significant amount of money with serial numbers that didn't match Nobuto's funds. However, Kiyoichi was shocked to find a foreign bag inside his safe that he had never seen before. In frustration, Kiyoichi confronted Takeda, accusing him of planting the bag in his safe. Kubo quickly intervened to subdue Kiyoichi. Still, Kiyoichi continued to defend himself insisting that he had never placed the bag in his safe and asking Tetsuo to vouch for him. Unfortunately, Tetsuo had no knowledge of the bag because when the safe was opened the day before, Kiyoichi had asked him to turn around, so Tetsuo didn't know what was inside it. Takeda promptly opened the box, revealing a skeleton inside. After an examination by Nobuto's personal doctor, it was confirmed that the dental records matched Nobuto's, confirming it was his skeleton. Additionally, they found a tablet in the bag containing the fake video of Nobuto. Kubo was in disbelief that Kiyoichi had killed Nobuto, and he expressed disappointment in Nobuto for his actions, which could strain their relationship with Matori. Therefore, Kiyoichi had to accept his punishment, and they planned to confiscate the money. Kiyoichi still defended himself, urging them not to take the money he had worked so hard to accumulate. He also warned Kubo not to be easily swayed by such tricks, as it could jeopardize their organization. Kubo allowed Kiyoichi some time to explain his side of the story. Kiyoichi then recounted how someone had hacked his email account and instructed his associate to send an envelope to his home. However, upon hearing this, Tetsuo suspected Takeda's involvement. So they decided to search Kiyoichi's apartment to find the envelope. Unfortunately, they found nothing until Takeda received an email about Nobuto. Kiyoichi believed it was a fake email, attempting to make him appear as one of the culprits in the armored car robbery alongside Nobuto. He also suspected that Tetsuo might have informed Takeda about the safe. Kiyoichi thought that when Takeda wanted to check the money in the safe, he must have also placed the bag inside, making Kiyoichi believe that Tetsuo and Takeda conspired to frame him as Nobuto's killer. 
Takeda tried to deny it, but one of his subordinates had recorded Takeda opening the safe and confirmed that the bag had been there from the beginning. This convinced Kubo that if Kiyoichi were found guilty Takeda should quickly take Kiyoichi to Matori with a corpse bag, essentially considering him as good as dead. Tetsuo recalled the moment when Takeda had asked him to share everything he knew about Kiyoichi. He explained that he had just come from Kiyoichi's apartment, searching for anything suspicious like bugs or hidden cameras. Kiyoichi believed that Takeda might try to frame him as Nobuto's killer. Kiyoichi had checked his safe, but Tetsuo wasn't allowed to see what was inside. This made Tetsuo suspicious that Kiyoichi was hiding something in there. When Tetsuo and Kiyoichi arrived at Takeda's place, Tetsuo asked for permission to use the restroom. During this time, Tetsuo sent a message to his wife, instructing her to retrieve the evidence back he had hidden in the drain and to carry out the plan he had discussed with her. In the end, after all these incidents, Takeda allowed Tetsuo to go home and asked him to forget everything that had transpired. As he was about to leave, Tetsuo felt a slight sense of guilt towards Kiyoichi, as he knew that Kiyoichi didn't kill Nobuto or even betraying their organization. Some time ago, Ka Sen had asked Tetsuo to purchase equipment like a rope ladder and other tools for her secret mission. Her task was to reach Kiyoichi's room on the ninth floor of the apartment building. Tetsuo's plan involved Ka Sen descending to the tenth floor using the emergency exit and then returning to the ninth floor through another emergency exit. Once there, she only needed to pass through the apartment room divider to reach Kiyoichi's room. Fortunately, Kiyoichi's balcony door was unlocked, allowing Ka Sen to enter quickly and locate the safe. Tetsuo explained that Kiyoichi probably used a four-digit numeric code, which meant there were 10,000 possible combinations. To narrow down the options, Tetsuo suggested using the ALS flashlight that Kiyoichi had purchased earlier. His special flashlight could detect fingerprints. Eventually, the numbers Kiyoichi frequently pressed glowed in the dark. With these known numbers, Ka Sen only had to try 24 possible combinations. However, after three unsuccessful attempts, the password buttons would lock for 10 minutes. Ka Sen realized that this method could take a lot of time if she continued entering the wrong password. Ka Sen, seeking guidance, prayed to Buddha to help her figure out the numeric sequence, and her prayers were answered. She swiftly placed the bones of the man who had harmed Reika into the safe. The following day, Ka Sen was back home and received the good news from Tetsuo that the problem was now resolved. Meanwhile, Kiyoichi attempted to rebel and escape to the rooftop of the apartment building. However, Takeda and his men had already caught up with him. Kiyoichi hurriedly descended using the emergency door to the balcony adjacent to his room. As he was about to cross, he noticed fresh scratches on the divider, as if caused by a hook from a rope ladder, raising suspicion for Kiyoichi. But he had to avoid Takeda with his men and return to his room to retrieve his last stash of money. In a bid to create chaos, Kiyoichi threw the money from the safe into the air, shouting that Takeda and his men had just robbed him and urging people to call the police. This forced Takeda and his group to retreat. In that moment, Kiyoichi became convinced that someone had broken into his room, considering that his escape route led directly to his room. However, Kiyoichi realized it couldn't have been Tetsuo since he was always with him. He suspected another culprit, possibly Tetsuo's accomplice. Tetsuo, on the other hand, didn't head home immediately because he was exhausted and hadn't slept at all. Instead, he decided to stop by Reika's apartment to rest. Meanwhile, Kiyoichi in disguise called Matori and explained that he was not the one who had killed Nobuto. Rather, he accused Tetsuo of being the true culprit. Kiyoichi shared all of Tetsuo's sinister plans with Matori, leaving it up to Matori to believe or not. He emphasized that if Matori considered him guilty, the real killer of Nobuto would go free. Kiyoichi also revealed that all the organization members were aware of Nobuto's involvement in the armored car robbery, so Takeda and the others were only pretending to search for him to manipulate Matori into staying with the Yakuza. Matori appreciated Kiyoichi's insights, but insisted that there was no time limit for him to find the real perpetrator, whether it was Kiyoichi or Tetsuo. Nevertheless, Matori was upset and called Kubo to share Tetsuo's data. He also asked Kubo to purchase an item for him. That night, 
Tetsuo woke up to a message from Kasan, urging him to come home quickly. At the same time, he noticed two individuals approaching Reika's apartment. To his surprise, they turned out to be Matori and his henchmen attempting to enter Reika's apartment forcefully. After successfully gaining entry, Matori instructed his subordinates to wait outside, wanting to investigate Nobuto's disappearance on his own. Tetsuo, who had been hiding inside the closet, was taken aback by the sight of Matori. Even more astonishing was the ALS flashlight that Matori held, which made Tetsuo realize that the problem was far from over, leaving him perplexed about the next steps. As Matori checked the bathroom, he found it unusually clean, devoid of any traces of sweat, hair, or fingerprints. His astonishment grew when the ALS flashlight revealed peculiar bloodstains, suggesting that Nobuto had met his end in that very place. Overwhelmed by grief, Matori broke down in tears, realizing that his son was truly gone. He then directed the flashlight toward the closet, revealing Tetsuo. Tetsuo, on his knees, confessed that he was responsible for all of this. He hadn't anticipated the situation ending like this, but he had reached his breaking point and could no longer run. Tetsuo no longer wanted to put his family in danger, and he had decided to surrender. Meanwhile, Reika and Kasen patiently waited for Tetsuo to join them for dinner. However, Matori had other plans for Tetsuo and ordered him to sit with his hands behind his head, warning him that he wouldn't hesitate to use the gun he had if Tetsuo resisted. Matori noticed the injury on Tetsuo's head, a result of Kiyo Ichi's actions. He made it clear that he wouldn't involve the police in his son's death caused by Tetsuo. Instead, Matori intended to take matters into his own hands, a course of action that might lead to the death of Tetsuo and his family. Tetsuo pleaded with Matori not to involve his family in this matter, emphasizing that they were innocent bystanders. However, Matori viewed Tetsuo as heartless since he had already taken away Matori's only family, his son. Matori harbored the intention of subjecting Tetsuo's family to a gruesome death right before his eyes. Unable to accept this, Tetsuo summoned the courage to confront Matori and attempted to kill him. Surprisingly, Matori wasn't armed with a gun, but instead had a can of pepper spray, which caused Tetsuo's eyes to sting intensely. Nonetheless, Tetsuo managed to kick Matori away just before Matori could answer a call from Kubo, destroying Matori's cell phone in the process. On the other end, Kubo encountered difficulties in getting in touch with Matori and decided to inquire directly with his subordinates about their boss's whereabouts. One of the subordinates admitted he didn't know what was happening since he had been instructed to wait in the car while their boss was at Reika's apartment. He hesitated to meet Matori as he found him quite intimidating. Hearing this, Kubo assumed that everything was still proceeding smoothly. Meanwhile, Tetsuo and Matori continued their intense struggle. Matori, overwhelmed by grief over the loss of his beloved son, chose to do the unthinkable using a knife. Just as he did this, the police arrived at the scene, responding to a report of a disturbance in the apartment. They knocked on the door, urging whoever was inside to open it. Tetsuo, fearing the consequences of the situation, desperately tried to silence Matori to prevent any noise that might attract the police. Tragically, Matori succumbed to his injuries, losing his breath. Tetsuo answered the police's call, assuring them that everything was fine and attributing the noise to a runaway hamster he was trying to catch. He apologized for any disturbance caused. Thankfully, the police accepted Tetsuo's explanation and departed. A short while later, one of Matori's subordinates followed him and found the disarrayed room, noticing that Matori's shoes were missing. He suspected that Matori might have returned home earlier. He reported these findings to Kubo, explaining that he had to hide when the police arrived and that Matori was now unaccounted for. In the meantime, Kasen reached out to Tetsuo, who had not yet returned home, to inquire if everything was all right and offer her assistance. Tetsuo reassured her that there were no issues and asked Kasen to continue keeping Reika company, promising that he would be home soon. While Reika waited for dinner, she found herself longing for her father. Memories of her childhood flooded her mind, and she held her dad in high regard, almost like a hero. She also came to the realization that Nobuto was a rough individual, and her affection for him had waned. Reika's hope was now centered on Tetsuo's return from work. Meanwhile, amidst a heavy downpour, Tetsuo drove his car into the forest, summoning the last reserves of his strength to dig a grave for Matori after their earlier confrontation. Upon finally returning home, 
Tetsuo received a slap from Kasen, who was genuinely concerned about him. She had feared that she might lose her husband forever. Kasen was relieved and thankful that Tetsuo had come back home safely. Tetsuo couldn't believe he had reunited with his family. Reika, however, felt a bit annoyed because her dad's arrival had delayed their dinner plans. She asked her dad not to worry her mom anymore. Life went back to normal the next day, with Tetsuo going back to work and Reika attending school and enjoying time with her friends. Then, one day a TV broadcast warned of an approaching typhoon disaster for the Tokyo and Kanto regions. Watching the powerful winds on TV, Tetsuo began to worry about Matori's grave. He feared it might not be deep enough and could be exposed to flooding or landslides. Still, Tetsuo tried to reassure himself that things would be okay. Moral lesson from the story, when digging a secret grave, always check the weather forecast to avoid your buried secrets getting exposed by a surprise typhoon.